Hi everyone, welcome to University of Louisville Health Jewish Hospital. My name is Dana Settles. This is a follow-up video to our initial introduction to cardiac anesthesia setup. I felt like there was a few more things that might be helpful as you're learning to perform cardiac anesthesiology, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, there's a lot of concepts that I teach my residents when they're first starting out. It's really important that you understand the procedure uh, as you go along so that you're a better anesthesiologist. So first thing that I want to talk to you all about is cannulation strategy. Um, and I apologize, I'm not the best artist, but it um, certainly illustrates the point. So here we go. First we're going to start out, this is your left atrium. Basically I'm going to create our circulatory system as a tube system so that you can see what I'm trying to illustrate here. There's your LV. We're going to go out the aortic valve. And then this, again, we're just kind of creating this so that you all can see what I'm trying to illustrate here. And then we've got our three main branches off the aorta. Okay, so let's just first talk about this. So you've got your left atrium, your mitral valve, your left ventricle. This is going out the LVOT, left ventricular outflow track. This is your aortic valve. These are your two coronaries coming off the sinus of Valsalva. And this is going up your ascending aorta, your aortic arch, and then going down to your descending aorta. It's really important that you know this anatomy. So first, let's talk about your first branch. What's the name of that? So this is going to be your anominate. Don't say brachiocephalic. Make sure you say anominate, your clinicians. Next, this breaks off into the right common carotid and the right subclavian. This is going to be your left common carotid, and this is going to be your left subclavian. Okay? So, make sure you know this anatomy. So, let's talk about cannulation. First, the number one first cannula that goes in is going to be your arterial. To go on bypass, you need a major artery and a major vein. So, first cannula is going to go in your ascending aorta. That's number one. Number two, you need your venous cannula. And again, we're talking about cannulation. Next is going to be your venous cannula, and that's not, this is your arterial side, but your venous cannula is going to go from the right atrial appendage down towards the inferior vena cava. Uh, keep in mind that that's just one single venous cannula. You can do bicaval cannulation where it depends on the procedure that you're doing, but the surgeon will need to place a super, uh, venous cannula in the SVC and a venous cannula in the IVC, and that's called bicaval cannulation. So one in the SVC, one in the IVC, you Y it and send that off to your pump. The third cannula that you would place is the antegrade cardioplegia. We'll just say AC. So where's that going to go? Let me show you. I'm going to put a big X right here. That X stands for your cross clamp, okay? That's where your cross clamp goes. This is where your antegrade cardioplegia goes. So your aortic valve closes here while you're on pump. You have your cross clamp here. So when you give antegrade cardioplegia, it goes straight down the coronaries and stops your heart. The fourth cannula that you can place if you needed it would be a retrograde cardioplegia, okay? So the location of that is going to be in your coronary sinus, and that's basically the venous system for your coronary arteries. So um, indications for this retrograde cardioplegia, let's talk about that. So indications for that would be severe AI. So if we go back to our drawing here, if you have severe AI, when you give antegrade cardioplegia, that cardioplegia would just dump into the left ventricle. 
and that's not effective. So what you need to do there is give retrograde so that it's the venous drainage system to the coronaries and then by the venous system, then it will stop the heart. So one reason for retrograde cardioplegia is going to be severe AI. The next reason that you might need retrograde cardioplegia is if you have severe left main disease. And we're going to talk about coronary anatomy in just a little bit, but if you have severe left main disease, when you would run antegrade cardioplegia, the left main splits into the LAD and the circumflex. You would not protect the heart that way. Your cardioplegia would not protect the entire anterior and lateral surface of the heart. So if you have severe left main disease, a lot of times you would need to run, place a retrograde cardioplegia so that you could get your cardioplegia in that way. So let's briefly review our cannulation strategy. First, your arterial cannula is going to go in the ascending aorta. Second would be your venous cannula. They will place that in the right atrial appendage. That will go down towards the IVC in a standard single venous cannula. Third, the antegrade cardioplegia will go down here closer to the coronaries. Once you go on bypass, this is where your cross clamp goes so that your arterial cannulation can run blood flow up to the head, up to the upper extremities, and down towards the body. And that cross clamp stops blood flow there. And then your antegrade cardioplegia goes down the coronaries. And then fourth, we discussed when you would want to place a retrograde. The retrograde cardioplegia cannula will go into the coronary sinus. And then the indications for that are severe aortic regurgitation and severe left main disease. And real briefly, I just want to go over the different types of cardioplegia, the way that you can give it. One, you can give it antegrade, which means it goes down the coronary arteries. The reason that we do that is to stop the heart so we can protect it and preserve it while we're on bypass. The second way we can give cardioplegia is retrograde, which is in the coronary sinus. That's giving your cardioplegia through the venous drainage system of the coronary anatomy, coronary arteries, excuse me. The third way is called handheld. This is when the surgeon will come over here and he or she will actually remove the coronaries off of the aortic root. And it just depends on what procedure doing, you're doing. But if the coronary arteries need to come off, the surgeon can actually place a cannula down these coronaries and they will say handheld right, and then they'll run cardioplegia down the right coronary, and then he or she will say handheld left, and they'll run cardioplegia down the left main coronary. So those are the three different ways that the surgeons will give cardioplegia. Next, uh, we're going to take a minute, erase this, and then we are gonna go over your coronary anatomy. Okay, next I wanna go over the coronary arteries with you. It's important as you're doing this, you're going to be doing a lot of cabbages. And when you do these, I want you to look at your heart casts ahead of time, understand which vessels are blocked, and then the vessels that we're going to bypass. So it's important to know your anatomy. So let's go over that now. First, you have your left main. Your left main divides into your LAD and your circumflex. Now you also need to know the branches off these. So a little mnemonic that I use to help people in terms of your LAD branches is to remember LSD. So off of your LAD comes your septals and your diags. Off your circumflex, I want you to remember comb. So off of your circumflex comes your obtuse marginal branches. So you often hear the surgeons talk about OM1, OM2, OM3, etc. Now every now and then when you're doing a heart bypass surgery, you'll hear them say that they have bypassed the ramus. The ramus is an embryologic remnant that only about 20% of the population has, and the ramus runs right between the LAD and the circumflex. So not all of us have them, some do, some don't, about 20%, but 
but they can get significant blockages and you do need to, you can bypass them. So this is where your ramus would sit, is right between your LAD and your circ. And that's about 20% of the population. Next we're going to go over the RCA. So we've hit the anterior surface of the heart, the lateral surface, and now we're going to go over the right side and the inferior side. Off of the RCA, I want you to remember RAM. And those are going to, that's going to be your acute marginal branch. And you can get several of those. And off of your RCA, in most people, also comes, should I go this way? So you have the acute marginal branches off your RCA, and on the inferior side of the heart, usually comes your PDA, your posterior descending artery. Now, if you hear about the cardiologist mentioning a right dominant circulation or a left dominant circulation, if your PDA comes off of your right, off of your right coronary, then it's a right dominant circulation. In some patients, your posterior descending comes off of your circumflex, and that's a left dominant circulation. So I want you to start to get used to looking at cath reports and understanding which vessels need to be bypassed. And that way you can communicate that better to your ICU team. All right, this will be the last part of this video. I'm going to go over a really simple method to learn how to float a swan. So in our last video, we talked about sterile technique and how to basically prepare yourself to float it, but you need to be able to interpret the values. So there's a really simple way to understand the values when you're floating your swan, and it is called the rule of sixes. So as you're floating your swan, we're just going to talk through the different steps. So first, your swan is going to sit right outside the heart, and this is going to be your CVP number, and that's usually going to be about six. Next, you're going to cross, go into the right atrium, cross the tricuspid valve, and then you're going to be in the RV. When you're in the RV, you get this systolic step up. Once you cross into the RV, you're going to see a systolic jump. So that's what I want you to remember about the RV. So once you cross in, you're going to get a systolic jump, and then your pressure is going to jump up to about 30 over 6. Next, you're going to keep continuing the swan, cross the pulmonic valve, enter the PA, and once you enter the PA, that's when you get the diastolic step up. So here, then that's the diastolic step up, right there. Now, your number has jumped up to 30 over 12. So there's the systolic jump up when you're in the RV to 30, cross into the PA, and you get that diastolic jump. Then if you wanted to wedge it, there it would flatten out, and that would be your wedge at 12. So, and if you don't want to wedge your swan, which most of us don't, your wedge is usually just your bottom diastolic number there. So I hope this helps you understand a little bit better the swan as you're placing it and floating it. And keep in mind that these are normal PA pressures, not ones on patients with pulmonary hypertension. I hope this helped you today. This is our basic setup for University of Louisville Health. This is our introduction to how to perform cardiac anesthesiology. First, we, in our first video, we went over the room setup. And now in this setup, we've gone over cannulation strategy, cardioplegia, the coronary anatomy, and the rule of sixes for floating a swan. I hope this has been helpful to you. Thank you.